You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. You know, Matt, we used to talk about supply chain disruption from factory, getting it into our warehouses, things like that. And today... Our disruption is global. It's everywhere. It's yeah. uh, in every country at this point. Um, you know, emanating starting in China, we saw you know a month ago we were starting dealing with this because of the production level, and then now we're starting to see it on the retail side. Um, we're starting to see delays and deliveries to homes because there's. I don't. I don't think some of the delivery people can keep up with the demand that's going to start happening with e-commerce. Um, and our supply chains are, you know, still a little bit slow as China and Vietnam and other people start ramping up. Um, and it's just, it's a real challenging time. I don't even know how to describe some of the stuff that we're seeing. It's so difficult and so new in many ways. Yeah, man. It's, I, I can't get over on how quickly things have changed. We went from really kind of dealing with the trade war. I mean, The phase one of the China agreement went into effect on February 14th, and here we are a month later, and our lives are totally turned upside down, Um, and we've been doing these weekly calls to help the industry navigate the coronavirus, and as you stated, you know, things we've we've been hearing on the China side, things are starting to return to normal, but the problem is demand in the Western world is getting crushed right now. And so we wanted to have an expert on that really can help us do a deeper dive into what's happening on the logistics side. Uh, And Mike Pisa, who's the senior vice president of corporate business development and customs brokerage at Apex Logistics International. Mike is a dear friend. He's been on the show before. Uh, Apex is a huge supporter of FDRA. But Mike has also been feeding us. Yeah, he's been feeding us these these Intel reports as to what's happening in the air freight space as it relates to China and the coronavirus. So, Mike, we wanted to have you on now. We're taping shoe in from a variety of different locations because of this virus, but doesn't mean we don't want to get the information out. So, Mike, welcome right. back to shoe in. We're super excited to have you on. Thanks for coming on board. Hey, guys, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think this is my second appearance on Shoe In, I'm, and I'm honored to be a repeat uh, repeat guest here. Repeat offender. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mike, as you sit right now, um, where do we stand as it relates to kind of, you know, as we were before we went on, you were talking about you were in China in January and how things have changed so dramatically. Yeah. And we, we should start- we should tie this. We should tie this episode is recording March 16th, just so people know as a marker yeah, where we're at. Because things could change dramatically in a week from now. But right now it's March 16th. Yeah. You're so exactly from right. there, Mike, where where are we where have you been and where are we headed? You're right. It's a very fluid situation. That's for sure, Andy. So, uh, you know, things seem to be changing by the day. Uh, you know, right before we came on here, you know, I mentioned that I was in China in the middle of January and we started to hear, um, you know, about this virus that was coming out of Hubei province. And and for me, it's been fascinating, uh, you know, how fast it's kind of uh, moved around the world. It's, you know, two months from, from the middle of January and uh, the world has kind of really slowed down as a result of this situation. I, you know, it's, you know, the air freight market's been very interesting to follow here. Um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of different things, obviously, coming out of Chinese New Year. So you had a, a, a week off there, and, uh, and that's obviously been extended uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, as it relates to the supply chain world, though, I think the, the most interesting thing, uh, the most disruptive factor has really been the lack of passenger aircrafts going in and out of China. Um, if you look at China like as a whole from the air cargo market, about 40% of the total capacity is passenger aircrafts uh, on the air freight side. Um, so if you take 40% of the air freight capacity coming out of China, and then you have a real increased demand as you know factories come back to work, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, people try and get their supply chains uh, back up and running. Um, and I think the other thing people need to, you know, that should be noted is that uh, a lot of raw materials come out of China. So if you look at mm-hmm. Vietnam, 
you know, for example, Vietnam's seeing a real strong demand right now. It's mainly because all the raw materials are able to get from China to Vietnam, and uh, that's creating quite a backlog there. You can't really find too many products that don't have a component uh, that's made in China, whether it's electronics, footwear, clothing. Uh, so, you know, there's it's definitely having a global impact on the air freight market, and I think the situation is continuing to evolve here. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, for, from that standpoint, I really want to bring out that point you made about kind of passenger. So it, what you're talking about is basically if, if Matt and I hopped a flight over to China, uh, we visit some footwear factories, and then we were heading back from Hong Kong or Beijing back over to the U.S. That's where somebody uses that extra capacity on that airline we're flying on and, and puts puts products and goods. Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly correct. So yeah. 40% and, of the total cargo space, approximately, it actually flies on those passenger aircrafts. And you've seen all the, the passenger airlines that have canceled flights, right? From right, right. British, Delta, American, right. United. They're all can- – so you take that 40% of what I call belly capacity out of the right. market. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a disruptor. And it's something we don't think about. I guess the other part that we don't think about, but I, I started to when um, Mike and I would have conversations at events, but, you know, we always see ourselves as a, where the sun usually revolves around us, right? Or the world revolves around us in footwear. And we forget that we're competing for space against electronics and household items and any number of stuff. So, you know, it's not just uh, footwear trying to get on, get on uh, these ships or these airplanes, uh, it's everything else. So Mike, when, when you're seeing that and you're seeing this, this big rush to catch back up um, on the production side where we've seen delays and, and having to push out production timelines, all of a sudden everybody's going to be hopping on the same ships or hopping on the same, the same plane. So it, does that mean that there's going to be price spikes or, you know, how, how do you see this playing out over the, over the next you know, eight weeks or so. Sure. You know, um, you're making a very good point there, Andy. And um, we've seen these catastrophic, catastrophic events in the past too. So we kind of, we, we have a general feel on how the uh, air freight market reacts. And I look back to like the volcanic eruption in Iceland a few years back, right? The port strike in LA Long Beach and uh, both those, uh, two events in particular were major disruptions in the air freight market uh, for different reasons. Um, and typically what we see is, um, you know, certain supply chains are, are very affected by this. And I'll, I'll turn to like the auto industry, for example, right? That they need all the parts and components to assemble those vehicles in the U.S. So their supply chains are, you know, historically uh, very disrupted. And they're usually the ones that need the air freight capacity the most on the, on the return at you know, normalcy, I'll, I'll, I'll say. Um, and, uh, you know, regarding, so, so you have a real increased demand as these, you know, especially in the auto market, um, you know, when these events happen. And then and other industries follow and everything, but it does create a large spike in the, the price just because there's such a demand um, supply uh, difference that you see these large spikes. So, I, you know, after the port strike in LA a couple of years ago, I was like, oh man, I don't think I'll ever see anything as, as high in terms of rates and pricing or, you know, capacity and different, uh, capacity difference to demand. But I, I think right now we're, this might, this, we're in, we're, we're in record breaking time in terms of air freight market. Um, we're still, you know, the, the demand is still coming back strong and the rates are continuing to kind of climb up higher here. Um, you know, in terms of me trying to predict out seven weeks, I think that might be a little difficult. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, we talked about the China air capacity uh, as it relates to passenger aircrafts. But now if you take into account uh, the president's message last week uh, regarding Europe, um, you know, the, the Europe situation now has no passenger aircraft. So when if you talk about the China to the U.S., it's it's 40 percent of the market, but actually China to Europe the passenger aircrafts make up 80% of the, the total uh, cargo capacity. So, you know, that situation is still kind of taking shape here since it, it's, there's some new travel restrictions and uh, a lot of the European carriers are, are going to, uh, you know, park their aircrafts. But I, I think the situation is very fluid and, um, you know, we, we kind of have to keep our eyes on it, but trying to predict, predict out seven weeks, I, I think what I can see for about a month, we're going to see a steady increase uh, in, in rates, and and uh, and we'll have to see what it looks like after that. 
Yeah, Mike, I'm trying to understand how, you know, again, and with my prediction hat on where we're headed in the sense that if you have demand getting curtailed in the, in the Western part of the world and the European market and the American market, and then we have this, you know, even the president said on Friday, there's going to be this pent up demand that gets unleashed once we get clear of that. And we all hope that happens. Not entirely sure if it will, but we hope that happens. Um, but is anyone, is any shoe company better positioned than another to take advantage of air freight? Um, how does air freight track with just overall, the overall movement of goods, ocean versus air? And then let's think about countries. If, if you're in Vietnam, are you better positioned from a rate perspective than you are if you're in China or if you're in Cambodia? I'm just trying to kind of lay out the, the KPIs that usually go into the analytics behind the rates and which yep. which channel to use, if, if that all makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. So, you know, I, I don't know if I can answer, you know, is one company profile better positioned? And I think what we see is that, um, you know, we, we work obviously with a number of different footwear importers. Um, and, you know, we, we generally, a pair of shoes, basically the difference between putting a pair of shoes on the ocean or the air it's about four times different in your landed cost per pair of shoes. Um, okay. So that, that's, that's okay. the general analysis that we've done uh, over the course of years. This situation obviously is not traditional. Um, and I think what you what you find here is that the, because the air freight rates are, are increasing, it, it becomes cost prohibitive, right, to ship air, you know, air freight for some of the shoe importers just because – you know, if you're going to pay six or seven dollars per kilo of air freight, for example, um, you know that might be cost prohibitive to to your. You know, it, it'll make you go negative on that pair of shoes, so you're, you're not going to want to do that. Um, so it, it's, um, you know, I, I don't know if one one particular profile is better positioned than the next, but I think you know you have to look at inventory controls too, like um, you know, how much inventory are you storing in the U.S.? How long can you last? And, and, and your retail partners as well. You know, I, you know, I've been curious to hear there's been a wide range of responses from the retail partners, um, you know, how they're handling this situation. Are they going to keep orders if they're late um, or, the, you know, things of that nature? And uh, I think that, that'll be interesting to see how it plays out as well. Yeah. I mean, what about the country, country specific stuff? Um are you seeing differencing differences in rates coming out of Vietnam versus out of China versus out of Cambodia or, or Indonesia? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some differences in rates. Um, and I think diversity, I think the ones that we're seeing that are able to handle this the, the best are the ones that maybe have some diversity in terms of country of origin. And also they've built in some lead times into their, um, into their supply chains. And I'll give you one example, like, you know, we, we we started moving a, a fair amount of sea air product, uh, so we're shipping it out of China by sea, and then we're flying it, um, you know, from a, a different location into the U.S. So it's longer transit time. We need to have that that lead time built into your supply chain. So I think uh, supply chains that have some lead time built in and have some flexibility are the ones that are going to succeed. And and uh, you really have to be on your toes too with this. You, you got to be thinking kind of outside of the box a little bit. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> I think that the challenges for a lot of companies, Mike, uh, is the old way of managing supply chain is crumbling before our eyes. Correct? I mean, it's it, Excel has been a wonderful, wonderful tool for many, many years, but we're hitting the point where you simply can't you can't use machine learning and you can't use full computer analysis on Excel. It's still human component. And even if you've done supply chains for 20 years, you're experiencing issues you haven't seen before. So our, our ability to factor in things beyond our, our limited scope on the supply chain side as a, you know, as a supply chain professionals looking at this, it's really where you start to need systems to help, plug in rates and plug in capacity and plug in all these different things. So for a long time now, people have been pushing off technology because either they didn't want to pay for it or they felt like they still had a, a good grasp of what they were doing with Excel. And again, Excel is probably one of the you know main management tools of all our economies globally. It's a, it's a wonderful system. But in times like this, when you start talking about agility, 
and managing product and, and, and deciding which product we make in the factory and when, how fast we're going to ship it in here based on inventory levels. I don't, I don't think we're at a point where we can keep using Excel like we have in the past to, to, to really have agility to what you're talking about. What do you, what do you think about that? I fully agree with you. You know, we're, you know, we're seeing, uh, if you if you have some good purchase order management tools and consolidation tools and are able to move around uh, move around some of your production, that that's the key to success in this kind of environment. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, we we definitely have, we're seeing some very cool technology in terms of forecasting, and um, and I think that the companies that have those tools in place uh, can better react to these types of situations. Yeah. And I mean, there, obviously there's more and more companies coming online that are trying to help people manage all that stuff, but it's just, even if it's a small brand, I mean, it, it, you just can't, I don't know. It just, we can't do, we can't do the way we can't do business the way we've traditionally been doing business across yeah. everything. And and this is when a crisis hits, that it should open our eyes. Um, and you know, it should, it should make us reevaluate. And I think a lot of people did that to your point, when you're talking about previous crises during like the port strike, people started factoring in, you know, do I need to diversify where my shipments are going into? How do I do more air? Um, how do I rearrange my warehousing? Um, so obviously there's a constant churn on that, but what's really interesting to me is, and, and Mike, you work with a lot of companies, but where, where we once saw annual strategy planning, I feel like it's quarterly or monthly now, right? Making adjustments on the fly. I agree. And, you know, Matt, Matt was making a point a little bit earlier about, you know, coming out of the tariff situation. Yep. Yep. Uh, what, what we saw coming out of the tariff situation was a lot of companies, specifically footwear companies as well, they brought in some inventory early. Um, you know, so they, the inventory levels in the U.S. Were, were relatively healthy. And then when the tariff situation started to clear, um, they started, they had, they weren't focused on Europe, let's say. So they, they had a fair amount of inventory in the U.S., but they didn't have uh, enough inventory in Europe. So as soon as the tariff situation seemed to get resolved, they started shipping heavy inventory to Europe. Right. Uh, and then then you have this uh, situation that, that that came up. And, uh, you know, if you don't have the tools and visibility to see where you need that inventory, it could be very difficult to manage for sure. Yeah. You know, we talked to a number of people, Mike, uh, who were specifically on list 4B as for on the 301 tariff list that was supposed to take effect on December 15th of 2019. And so they were obviously nervous about the impact. A lot of that product was sold at mass retail at places like Walmart, Target and Kohl's and the like. And so they started to your point, they started to bring in a lot of inventory to avoid that, that expected increase. And then that increase was canceled with the China phase one trade agreement and so then they were stuck with this inventory. And I, ha- I had several folks tell me, hey, the silver lining of the trade war is that I got product in and I, I can navigate <laughs> through the coronavirus with this extra inventory. Right. The challenge is that now demand expectations, demand is going to totally crater. Um, and then we're going to still be stuck with this inventory. And, I, you know, I'd be re- I'll be really curious to see kind of once we get beyond this, what opens up and what starts flooding in and how much how much capacity is is strapped leading into the expected increase in demand after we get through it um and i have to think companies like steve madden uh, maybe the higher the fast fashion but maybe a little bit higher price point that stuff is really going to gravitate towards air freight because the margins can can take that on a little bit better than mass retail uh, but they're going to want to get stuff in the product line and start moving it through the system as quickly as they can yeah, I agree with you. I think that the the higher end, um, you know, footwear, you know, they, they their model is a little bit more conducive to air freight model. Uh, so you'll probably see that that come back first in terms of the air market. The, the yeah. other thing I'll mention, the other thing I'll mention is that the the Chinese factories um, and, and Vietnam, for that matter, they're pretty much all back and working full time, and um, you know, I'm, I'm we're curious to watch the impact here in the United States. Uh, you know, for a couple of weeks there, it was that the factories couldn't produce the goods because they weren't working. There was some truck shorting, uh, truck shortage issues in China. Uh, but now the, the the situation has reversed a little bit. Um, we're seeing um, we're seeing some warehouses uh, that can't necessarily receive the goods fast enough because 
they don't have enough labor to process the goods. Um, we're, we're hearing that some of the large uh, retail distribution centers are you know, trying to follow the guidelines of the CDC uh, to with regards to social distancing. So they don't want you know, too many people too close together. So they're you know, cutting uh, some of the, the receiving centers um, to half staff so they can follow those social distancing rules. So I think there's a lot of things that we've got to kind of keep an eye on to mm-hmm. see how much it's going to disrupt the supply chain here. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, that's I mean, I, this is just a weird, you know, the import numbers for January for footwear were down almost 16%, which was the lowest volume January in a decade. And this was before, as you said, you were in China on January 10th. Um, this was this drop was before the coronavirus. It had much more, I think, to do with the with the trade war. So once we get beyond, well, once the data starts coming in for March and April, um, I you know I I shudder to think of what the numbers will be on the import side. Um, and I you know it's these are just crazy times that we're living in for sure. And I, I know that Apex is uh, you guys are at the forefront of moving these goods and moving this product and. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, my hope is that we'll get through it, as we've been talking about, and there'll be a spike in demand. And then, you know, rising air freight rates would be a good sign of increased demand is, you know, is right. kind of how I view it. Yeah. And, you know, just back to the air freight point that we're, we're seeing uh, we're seeing some unique things happen right now, like, you know, in terms of capacity. Um, it's definitely the year of the freighter. So cargo aircrafts um, are obviously going to lead, lead the way with the very limited passenger uh, uh, capacity, capacity uh, cargo capacity on the passenger side. But we're also seeing some of the airlines now, um, you know, turn their passenger aircrafts into cargo aircraft. So they're, they're not going to take the seats out of the the air, air aircrafts, uh, but they're just going to run the the flight. Uh, just with the the cargo hold underneath the seats, um, so you know because there's such a capacity demand imbalance that that's you know you don't see that often. Uh, so, but I, I'm glad people are kind of you know thinking forward and uh, you know, trying to trying to find uh, solutions to to increase the capacity to meet the demand. So your so ghost flights. I have I have visions of like a my pair of shoes strapped in with the lap belt across it with the tray table down no, <laughs> waiting not, for not it to so take off. Please sit down. The the buckle seat belt light is on. <laughs> <laughs> the laboratories are not in use, sir. <laughs> um, you know it's interesting when when Mike's talking about like all you know these these uh, passenger airlines and how I mean it, that automatically i mean when we're hearing from the white house about bailouts for airline industries i mean that's a whole different that's a whole different issue when you when we when i was thinking of it in terms of you know just making sure these airlines are staying afloat so that we can get flights in and out of countries and move people around the world it's a whole other thing when you start talking about how much um, you know all the items we have in our households come with those people uh, so bailouts are hugely important for supply chains in ways that I didn't even realize. Yep, that's for sure. That's for sure. So, uh, where, where can you get some of that action, Mike? That's the question. <laughs> I, I know, that, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I do feel bad for the our airline partners. Right, we're very close with the airline partners, and uh, you know, they're definitely scrambling uh, to, to you know find solutions and things like that. So it, it's a it's a tough situation. Yeah, and, uh, even the, the yeah. ground handling yeah. workers. So the the like if let's take like L A or Chicago, um, the, the, you know, there's a lot of people on the ground that unload those aircrafts and things of that nature, and people are worried for their safety too, which is you know, right. I fully fully agree with. So they they don't want to necessarily come to work um, at, at this moment, and um, you know, so, uh, so there's some challenges there on the labor side in terms of you know actually you know, handling the cargo as it arrives and things of that nature. Yeah. It's things that we didn't have to think about, you know, months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, Man. Pretty interesting. Yeah. We'll we'll have to see what this, this turns out to, to, to look like here. Well, you know, it's one of those things, again, I, I, I hope people are taking the time during the pause. I know things are bad, but these are the times where you plan for the next phase. And if you could plan well and execute well, when you come out of it, we could be in better shape than we were before. That's the positive side of it. 
the negative side is it, it is going to, I mean, there is some Darwinist appeal to what's happening and people who have practiced bad business habits may not be around to, to see the, the uh, end of the tunnel, unfortunately. Um, but that's, that's sometimes how it happens. Um, and, you know, people who are practicing the right habits and doing the right things, um, you know, can get through it. So hopefully liquidity holds for everybody. Hopefully um, we'll see some relief and from proper policy from the government on what needs to be done. Um, and factories starting to, to work back up. And, and who knows, maybe we'll have a cure sooner rather than later or, or, excuse me, a vaccine for this. We don't know. But um, in trying times, we know that at, at the as we enter crises, we exit crises. And at the exit, you better have a strategy and a plan to hit it hard um, and hit it smart and wise. So that's what we hope for all our, our footwear brands and partners and factories and supply chain partners. Um, so Mike, appreciate, appreciate you coming on and chatting about that before you leave though. I think we're doing Jasmine. Are you there? Yes. Uh huh. What are we doing today? We doing what you got, what you getting? Yes, we are. So, um, like if you don't know, I think I'm not sure what we did on the episode you did before, but we do what you got, what you getting, which is, um, letting the audience know what you have on your feet now and what you're planning to wear. And I'm always interested in what our guests actually wear on a day to day. But what's even more interesting is that we're all like held captive at home. So we're like, <laughs> what are you wearing at home is even more interesting to me. Um, and I'll start off by saying I have a new pair of slippers on and don't judge me, but it says wake me up for wine on the top of them. Um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> and um, I'm hoping that I can do some form of vacation because our schedule is going to be interesting for the year 2020, but I'm hoping to buy some like sandals or something like that for a, a vacation coming soon. So there you go, Jasmine. <laughs> sounds like a good plan, you know, get ready for the vacation right. <laughs> what about you mike what do you have on while you're all working from home sure so i got a i got a pair of uh, blackout vans on my feet currently so the the black on black vans i, I awesome. yeah, yeah i enjoy them they're nice and comfortable kind of versatile you can do a bunch of different things in them wear them every day yep never go out of style yep yeah and i've been uh, i've been I've been in the market for a new pair of Steve Madden, so I'm gonna probably buy some here soon. Whenever I have to, uh, you know, wear some uh, dress casual suit shoes again, whenever that might be. So I right. I'll probably, I'll probably buy a pair of Steve Maddens here sometime in the near future. Okay. Well, we're all going to be working from home henceforth, Mike, so you don't need that anymore, do you? We're all going to just be in- sitting in my basement working for the internal way now. <laughs> That's right. I should probably be in the market for some slippers in that case. <laughs> to that end, I'm wearing uh, I'm wearing my Allbirds because it basically is slippers for indoor-outdoor. Um, and uh, and I'm going to be looking for a new pair of walking shoes for the, uh, the summer, so... I have. I'm starting my research now while I have the time here at the house, um, and uh, you know, pretty soon if if this quarantine continues, I'll have all my work chores done, and I'll have to find things to break so that I can go out to the garage and fix things to keep my sanity right. <laughs> <laughs> Matt. Matt. Yeah. So with that, I'm wearing a pair of Merrells. Um, that have that are leather they're hiking merrells they're leather and they're waterproof and i've been wearing them a lot lately and um hopefully i can get out and do some hiking we live near a lake so go around the lake although my wife went to the lake yesterday and it was she said it was the most crowded it's ever been and you basically were in a line a single file line to walk on the path around the lake <laughs> space out <laughs> six feet yeah so like all the huffing and puffing from the runners probably doesn't do well to oh not gosh. spread the virus um i moving forward what i want to get well i'm during lent i'm have given up all e-commerce purchases for myself personally it doesn't mean i'm not stockpiling crap from amazon um but i have not bought a pair of shoes in quite some time once i get beyond that i think to everyone's point i will need to invest in a pair of good slippers so uh, rg bear you can hook me up during lent or after the fact i will purchase them myself they do the unthinkable purchase them myself and i'll wear them happily during the quarantine <laughs> Awesome. 
Awesome, awesome. Well, folks, uh, as always, thank you for listening to Shoe and Show. We're covering the ins and outs of all things footwear. Today's special episode is on the supply chain disruption that we see uh, thanks to the coronavirus uh, and the impact it's having on our economy. And, and really want to thank Mike Pisa from Apex for coming on and really doing a deep dive helping helping educate us on what's happening but also all the different facets when we think because myself when i think of air freight i just think of big jumbo jets uh cargo you know just cargo planes and i you know never considered that uh a lot of the passenger planes are carrying a lot of the cargo that we need um to to continue our economic growth and prosperity so mike thanks so much for coming on and dropping all the knowledge that you always drop on us Guys, thanks so much for ha- having me. Really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Folks, you can find us on shoeandshow.com. You can find us on every single audio platform known to man, only English speaking only. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be translated into Chinese anytime soon. That would cost a lot more. Uh, but you can find us on iTunes, on Spotify. Uh, drop us a note on our website on the bottom left hand corner. There are voice notes now. You click on a button, you, re- you can record a voice note to us. Uh, that we can get in our inbox and listen to it. On that, you can tell us what you like, what you didn't like about the show, what you got, what you're getting in your closet right now. You can suggest guests and topics for future episodes, but just stay engaged. Um, Stay close to FDRA as as we keep on top of all the policy implications from bailouts uh, to to, uh, economic incentive packages for workers, etc., um, just stay tuned. Uh, keep visiting FDRA.org for updates. Uh, and our members definitely stay plugged into our, our calls, our weekly calls on all these issues. Um, until then, uh, folks, keep listening. We have 200 plus episodes. Um, you know, stay safe out there. Um, we appreciate each and every one of you. We want you to be happy, safe, um, healthy, and wealthy. So until next time, Shoein is out. Shoein has been brought to you by the FDRA the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.